reminder, great reminder. Thank you, choir, for that opener. <clears throat> and so we're excited about tonight. And I hope you enjoyed the good time of food and fellowship this afternoon. And I want to thank you publicly for bringing in the food that you brought in. And what I had was delicious. And so thank you for doing that. And I thought it was a good time of fellowship as well. And so we're excited about what the Lord's going to do for us tonight. So why don't we pray together and ask the Lord to bless us and to bless the service uh, this, this evening. All right, so let's bow our heads for prayer. Brother Brian, would you mind leading us in prayer? Ask God to bless the service, please. Another day, another service we come to, and, uh, hear your word preach, Lord. We're just thank you for, uh, for that, and thank you for your word and for your love. And just pray uh, that this guy and direct tonight be the pastor and bring the message, uh, bless the music, uh, bless the offering, bless every aspect of the service, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 wonderful Savior to me. Page 623. Let's sing all three verses as we stand and sing. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Thank you. 
Let's open up those hymnals to page 528. In the service of the King, page 528. Let's sing out to the glory of the Lord, for in the service of the King.
Let's open up our hymnals to page 301, Only Trust Him, page 301. You may remain seated as we sing, Only Trust Him. Page 301. <laughs> Oh, 
have some things that we want to go over. Um, I have a lot of spots on here that I need filled for the Cowboy Carnival, <clears throat> which is next Saturday. And if you're going to help with the Cowboy Carnival, if you signed up for something, it uh, starts at 1030, so we need you there about 9. If you're going to be working the Carnival Games, probably about 945. But we do need a lot of people to help set up. Right now, I think there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 slots to set up. And we have two, so we're not going to get a lot set up if that's the case, if that's all we have. Um, parking lot people, you can help with the setup, <laughs> like Brother Jones is on here. Craig Brown is on here. Both of those guys are helping with setup. Um, but then they're also doing parking lots. So hopefully the setup's all set up, and then we could, you guys could work the parking lot and things like that. We do have seven carnival-style games. I have one, two, three, four, four people working those. I have uh, run the Western play, Playland game. Nobody doing that. Help with loading the gospel train. Uh, they have a gospel train that they pull. <clears throat> Nobody's doing that. Um, the mechanical bull. Nobody signed up to help with the mechanical bull. Um, run the jail. Caden Messick. I don't know about that. He probably should be in jail, not run the jail. And, uh, but anyway, he signed up for that, I guess. <clears throat> Kenny, you did a good job of that last time. Um, run the bounce house, I got one for that. Run the obstacle course, nobody's doing that. Floaters, I got floaters that could float. I guess they could float to some obstacle courses or something. One person at a soul winning table, and then they've got more inflatables uh, that they have uh, purchased, so they need more, more people signed up for those things. So please, if you haven't signed up, sign up for the Cowboy Carnival. And if you could help us set up, we need everybody there probably... I'd say starts at 10.30, you need people setting up about 8 o'clock, all right? And then the rest of the games are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the, the kind of the program, what's going to happen is they'll come at 10.30. People will come in <laughs> at 10.30. Anybody that's already re pre-registered, we'll ask them, have you pre-registered? If they say yes, we'll just let them right in. Because right now we have, it looks like anywhere between, and how we get these numbers is um, the number of children that are coming. We figure if every child brings, if there's 1.5 parents for every child, that's the way that it's, it seems to work, about 1.5. Right now, we're at 1,500 people that will be there. If for some reason there's two for every child, then that takes us up to about 1,800 people that will be there. And so um, we, we have anywhere between 15 to 1,800 people that, are, that will probably have signed up and then that doesn't even include hardly any of our school parents. I don't know what their deal is, you know, why they haven't jumped on this yet. We haven't really, I don't know if it promoted it a lot in the school or not, but uh, they'll probably sign up, and I don't know how many church kids have signed up for it or not, <clears throat> but um, you do, it would save you some time if you registered. Everybody comes in at 1030, games are up and going, that kind of thing, until 11, 11 o'clock, everything shuts down, and they go over by a big uh, stage, and so we'll need a stage set up. Um, over there for the walkers, and, and they'll use the trick horse to present the gospel, and uh, then uh, he'll give the gospel and present the gospel through the horse and uh, give an invitation, and, and hopefully, prayerfully, people will get saved during that. And then uh, uh, we'll take them to the egg hunts, and they can run the egg hunts, and then once that's done, then they have time to play on the games for a little bit longer and the horseback, horse rides and all that kind of stuff. And so that's kind of the setup. It'll go to about 1 o'clock, so 10.30 to 1.00. They have a big race down there. It's one of the opening days of races, one of the races going on. And so um, we have to be out of there by like 3. Not that we have to, but he asked if we could be done. I said, absolutely, we'll be done by then. So shouldn't be any problem. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but anyway, let's be praying for a great day and praying. I hope that you're, you're there to help. So the sign-up sheet is on the back table. If you don't sign up, probably this week we'll be calling you, asking you if you can help in some of these things if you forget to sign up on the sign-up sheet. All right, can I have somebody take this back there for me so we can get back there? Somebody besides Kenny. Kenny doesn't need to do it. And he's been struggling with double pneumonia in his lungs. And so somebody with young legs, that's it. Brother Finkhart, yes, amen. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've met him or not. Melanie has a friend here. I'm glad Melanie and Michaela are here from college. And Melanie has a friend. This is our church family, so I'm sure she doesn't mind me saying this. And I won't embarrass him or anything like that. But this is Josiah. Josiah's from Maine, actually and has uh, moved to Florida as a freshman in Bible college, and him and Melanie, um, now uh, they, they've uh, started liking each other, and you know how that goes, right? <clears throat> uh, I'm watching him closely, Amen. all right, because that's what dads have to do when it comes to their little girl, 
And we've kind of busted Noli's bubble. You know how Noli, she's so planned out, Noli's so organized, Noli has everything down. You know, she knows who she's marrying. Who's she marrying? Paul, that's right. Where are they living? Next to me, yeah, that's it. She's, <clears throat> she's going to help him build the house because they're building the house. She's going to help him build the house so she gets pregnant. And then no longer will she be able to build the house anymore and because um, then she'll be pregnant. So she's got it, I mean, she's got it mapped out. And uh, so when Josiah came, Josiah did ask Melanie to be his girlfriend. He got my permission to do that. Amen? That's the way fellows should do it, right? Get dad's permission. So he got my permission to do it. And, um, uh, and I appreciate that. And so he came and, and surprised her on Thursday. We were up at Sight and Sound. We had it all planned. He had a good plan to surprise her. And I, you know how I am with that kind of stuff. I just thrive on that. I like it. <clears throat> so um, he, she, we got home about 9, 10. <clears throat> and uh, he was supposed to get there within like five minutes of us getting there. But he was with Austin. And Austin took him down to get some seafood, and then they're down in Ocean City, and Austin wants to order dessert, and Josiah's watching the clock because he knows he doesn't have time, and then they were a little bit later, so we tried to do things because Melanie was about to uh, wash her hair and do all this stuff, and we were trying to wait for her to do that because we figured, you know, she wouldn't want to have a wet head when he comes to the door. And uh, <clears throat> so we're, we're delaying and delaying, and finally he comes there and asks her in front of us to be his girlfriend, and he didn't have to do that, but he did it and, uh, and gave her a nice little gift, and it was all nice, and oh boy, it was just, uh, oh, my heart was just bitter, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, love was in the air that night, I'm telling you. I hope not love. I don't know about all that yet, but better not be yet. Better not be. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so uh, Noli was in bed when this was all happening. And so when she woke up the next day, we told her Josiah was there. And we told her that he asked uh, Melanie to be his girlfriend. And, and uh, she says uh, to me, she says, what? And she goes, I asked Paul to be my boyfriend. And I said, well, the, the, the way that you should do it is the boy should ask the girl, okay, to be his girlfriend. Well, I asked Paul back in the nursery to be my boyfriend. And so that kind of busted her bubble. I don't know what she's thinking now. But anyway, uh, if she thinks she's going to wait for him to do it or what. But anyway, poor little Noli got her bubble busted for, through all that, but I don't think it phased her much, did it, Tammy? No, nothing phases her hardly. So anyway, <clears throat> but I hope you get the chance to meet Josiah. He's a nice young man. Seems to be so far until he does something I don't like, and then he won't be. <laughs> and all fathers say, amen to that one. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. <laughs> don't forget, ladies, about the ladies' activity coming up. And also, if you would, uh, be praying about your part of an Easter offering to help us get that van or that bus, that mini bus. We showed you pictures of that this morning. And just be praying for a good weekend when the walkers are here. <clears throat> My iPad is running low, and I don't usually have that problem. I don't know what the problem is. So if I, if I sense that it's getting ready to shut down on me, I've got a cord over here. I might have to go get it and plug it in, and uh, we'll go from there. But it probably, it probably won't. I'll probably be all right. But if you see me go over there and get that, you'll know what's going on here. <clears throat> um, Revelation chapter 1, I'd like you to look at verse 10, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. We've been on Sunday nights, I've enjoyed looking at future things, future events, future things on God's timetable. We've studied uh, the rapture, we looked at the judgment seat of Christ, we saw the uh, rewards that we would be receiving at the judgment seat of Christ. We talked about the resurrected body, you know, when we're raptured, we get a glorified body, a resurrected body, and we preached on heaven, how we're going to go to heaven and be there with Jesus forever. And ever and ever. Amen. I can't wait for that. Then we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. And we learn the difference between the judgment seat and the great white throne judgment. And tonight, I want to answer an important question that people have asked me through the years. And the question is this. What will you and I do in heaven? You ever wonder that? What are we going to do in heaven? That's a good question, isn't it? What are we going to do? And um, what will happen uh, in heaven? Now, <clears throat> I'd like to think, just like today, we had a potluck dinner. I'd like to think we eat, we'll eat in heaven. That sounds, amen. I'm glad Kenny's with me. Kenny, we missed you. Man, I missed my amen corner back there. <clears throat> um, I'd like to think we eat in heaven. Amen. 
We have a marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what you typically do at a supper. You don't just sit there and twiddle your thumbs at a supper. You usually eat at a supper. And, of course, we know there's uh, angel food cake, right? And uh, there's angel cakes that are there in heaven. And, uh, huh? Ice cream. Yeah, I'm sure ice cream will be in heaven. That's amen. And so we've got uh, all that. I think we'd eat in heaven. <clears throat> and uh, some people will wonder what else we'll do. I believe we'll serve the Lord in heaven. Uh, I believe during the millennial reign, we're told that we will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. When Jesus is, sets up his kingdom here on the earth for a thousand years, we'll rule and reign with him. So we'll serve him in heaven. <clears throat> but there's one other thing I'd like to show you tonight I believe we'll do in heaven. And I believe this will be the main thing that you and I will do throughout all eternity. Okay? Now, it's something you and I can do down here on earth but it'll be something that we can do throughout all eternity. Now, we eat down here on earth, and we can serve the Lord down here on earth, so we're saying we'll hope to do those in heaven. But what is this one thing that we will do down here on, that we can do down here on earth that we will spend all eternity doing up in heaven? And that's what we want to look at tonight. Look at verse 10 of Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. And <clears throat> the Bible says this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So what day is that? You tell me. That's Sunday, right? It's a Sunday, and he's in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Verse 12 says, And I turned to see a voice. That's an interesting statement. You don't usually turn to see a voice. You would turn to hear a voice. But John said, I turned to see a voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and a girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head, was, his head and his hair were white like wool, his, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And that's interesting, okay? And so I'd like to tonight answer the question <clears throat> when we see here, it's one of the things that we'll do, and we'll look at several other passages of what you and I, I believe, will do in heaven. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, help me tonight to be a blessing, and I pray, God, you help us to get excited about eternity. Lord, help us to be encouraged to the message tonight, and Lord, I pray that you'd help me to be a blessing to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It was back on September 22, 1967. <clears throat> at Wheaton College in Illinois that Dr. V. Raymond Edmond, <clears throat> who was a Christian educator and a devotional writer, and he returned to the campus after a, an extended illness, and he was going to preach in the auditorium named after him, the Edmond Chapel. His subject was the presence of the king, and he began the sermon by telling uh, of an invitation that he once received from the king of Ethiopia. The king of Ethiopia asked, Ethiopia asked him to come, and he described in details the preparations and the protocol that preceded his visit, and he spoke of the sense of majesty he felt under, uh, upon speaking with the king. He spoke of walking down the aisle and having to pause and bowing and waiting to see if he would be allowed to proceed. <clears throat> and he talked about how it was just a glorious, intimidating, but wonderful experience, uh, and, and, uh, which he treasured throughout his life. And then he went on. To say this, he shifted gears after telling about that experience with meeting the king of Ethiopia. He switched gears and he said, but I speak primarily of another king. This chapel is the house of the king. Chapel is designed to be a meeting on your part with the king of kings and lord of lords himself. To the end, chapel is designed for the purpose of worship. Chapel is to be a time of worship, not lecture, not entertainment, but a time of meeting the king, coming, coming in, sit it down and wait in silence before the Lord. In so doing, you will prepare your own hearts to hear the Lord, to meet the King. Your heart will learn to cultivate what the Scripture says, to be still and know that I am God. Over these years, I have learned the immense value of that deep inner silence as David the King sat in the presence to hear from him. Now, after that statement, here's what happened. Just a few moments later, he collapsed. Right there in the pulpit, he collapsed and instantly was in the presence of the very king he spoke about. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
Now, <clears throat> Brother Hatfield, I, I know your heart probably feels this way. Brother Gorman, you probably feel this way as a preacher. And any other preachers that are here, you know, you think about it sometimes. How will you go to heaven? <laughs> and I often thought, think to myself, it'd be a joy, wouldn't it, to be preaching about the king or preaching about heaven? And all of a sudden, something just happens, and you just drop dead and go. So if you're going to go anyway, that'd be the way I'd like to go. Amen? No pain, no discomfort, no morphine, no none of that. Just out talking about Jesus and one minute being here on earth and the next minute being with him. <laughs> that'd be a wonderful thing to do that. And you know, what we find here in Revelation chapter 1, verses 10, 10 and on, what we read, we find John, <clears throat> he, uh, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day, the Bible tells us. This is the opening vision in the book of Revelation. John saw the glorified Christ uh, in, uh, among the golden lampstands as candlesticks in the enthroned and splendor and full of glory. And we find the next two chapters, what happens is John uh, <clears throat> then begins to relate a message from Jesus to those seven churches of the Asia Minor area. And, and it's recorded to us there in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And then you come to Revelation chapter 4 and 5. When you get to Revelation chapter 4 and 5, turn with me there. You'll find in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, you get a glimpse in, into heaven, and what we find is a great worship service that will occur around the throne of God. And, uh, and you know, it, we, have, we see the end events that are taking place of the earth, of history, and then all of a sudden there's this celebration that's taking place. A lot of commentators believe that these two chapters of the Bible are the greatest two chapters on, in all the pages of the Word of God that deal with the topic of worship. Worship. And I believe that's something that you and I will do throughout all eternity, is worship and praise the King. Let's think about our services down here on earth. You know, as we think about our services on earth, <clears throat> and as we strive to worship the Lord and serve the Lord and those things, when we think about the services, you know, there's three major components of of a service, number one would be that of praising God. And we've kind of done that a little bit tonight, haven't we? We praise God through singing. We've lifted our voices. We've talked about Jesus. The King of Kings is He. I like when the choir sings that song. Amen? And uh, we praise God a little bit tonight. Then there's been a little bit of prayer that we've done that as well. When we think about services down here on earth, and, uh, and when, we, when we have times of worship down here on earth, there'll be usually times of praise. There'll be times of prayer. And then there's times of preaching. So three main components. You have prayer, praise, and preaching, right? And that's what kind of makes up the service. Um, and, uh, but what I'd like to say this is when we think about heaven, I think I can show you this from the Bible, <clears throat> that there's only one of those things that we might think that happens in a service where we may be worshiping the Lord. One of those things will happen in heaven. And you know what that is? Well, let's think about it. Prayer. Will prayer be in heaven? Oh, I don't believe, Brother Hatfield, that we'll have prayer in heaven. I, I could be wrong on that, but I don't know that we'll have prayer in heaven, at least the way that we pray down here, okay? Uh, because when we pray down here, we pray to enter into His presence, and when we're there, we'll be in His presence. So it'll be absolutely different when we do that as we pray. And I don't know that we'll be praying in heaven the way that we would pray down here on earth. <clears throat> and then the other thing is, I'm going to be out of a job, because I don't believe they'll be preaching in heaven. Amen? I mean, why would you need preaching? Now, I would think, because our Bible tells us that the Word of God is, is uh, settled forever in heaven, that there may be times where we enjoy pouring over the Word of God. I would think that might be the case, because it's in heaven, we know that. And there may be those times where we enjoy pouring over the Word of God and those things. <clears throat> but when you think about preaching, preaching, what are we doing? We're exhorting one another when we preach. We're trying to get God's people to obey the Word of God and to live out the Word of God. But at that point, we won't have that anymore because, I mean, we'll be perfect. At that point, we'll be in our glorified bodies, right? Uh, and there will, won't be any sin, and so we won't have to preach on sin. We'll already be saved, so there won't be any preaching on salvation. And so preaching, I don't think there'll be preaching going on in heaven. And the only thing I can find in our services down here <clears throat> that if, if it consists of praise, prayer, and preaching, 
The only one that we can find in the Bible, that I believe that we can find in the Bible, would be that of praising God forever and ever and ever. All right? Now, that leads us to that one great dominating <coughs> heavenly uh, element, which would be that of praise. Praising God is that th third, is that one of those three elements that we'll do uh, when we get to heaven. You think about it. When you get to heaven, you read about the, these times of praising God, and we're going to look at them in just a few moments. When you read about it in the, on the pages of the Bible, you don't find uh, anyone having to crack a whip and demand that somebody worships God or praises God. You don't find that happening. What you find is you find God's people. You find that there's God's people that are there, and we wholeheartedly, we voluntarily, from the heart, are worshiping our King, King Jesus. Boy, it'd be great if that was the attitude of God's people today. When we come in the church from the heart, they're worshiping the Lord. And, uh, and you know, it brings us to that, those two chapters, these two great chapters on worship. And I want to share with you a few things about worship. And I hope it'll be a help to you uh, as we look at this on, in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. The first thing I'd like to share with you is, is that of the context. I mean, this is something that's going to happen in the future. I want you to see the context of worship. Look at Revelation chapter 4. And verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, <clears throat> which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now there's a, a, a phrase here. As you look at this, it says, A door was opened in heaven. And so from John's spot on the island of Patmos, we know John is in exile on the island of Patmos, and from his spot... John was able to gaze through an open door into heaven. And he saw something that he had never seen before. All right? And can you imagine that? Can you imagine what that must have been like for John? I mean, he is on the island of Patmos, um, and uh, he looks, and there's something, there's a door, it's open, he sees into heaven, and he sees something that he never have seen, has saw before. And what was it? It was God's people. It was a heavenly worship service taking place in heaven. Now, you have to understand the church at this point is raptured, okay? That, that triggered the final events in, in history of the world as what we would know. And now there's a great celebration would break out in heaven. I mean, the angels are there. The cherubims are there. The seraphims are there. The angelic forces in heaven, in the heavenly realm, they're there. The redeemed saints of all ages are there. And what do we do? We burst out in praise to our God, according to Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. You have to understand that John, at this point, he's the only surviving member of the original band of apostles. And he wrote this while he was experiencing trials or difficulties or a time of testing on the island of Patmos. Do you think John would have felt weary? I think he would have been weary. Do you think John was worried a little bit? I believe John was probably a little worried. Uh, do you think John was probably wondering whether his life and his work uh, his ministry was all over. I'm sure that probably had crossed John's mind at some point, whether his life and his work, uh, his ministry was all over. But then in the midst of his exile, during that exile, then he suddenly hears a voice and he turns to see what's speaking to him. And what does he see? Well, he sees verse 1. He sees a door open and he's able to see a heavenly worship service taking place place. Now, this was an extraordinary moment. He was able to view what was taking place in heaven. And so that's the context of what we'd say of worship in heaven. Now, let me show you something else. There's a center of worship, the center. As you look at verses 2 and 3, you'll find the center here, because John says, I immediately was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. Now, notice that phrase, those two words, a throne, was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. All right, that's interesting because there's that word throne. And then in verse 3, And he that, that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. <clears throat> and so you find this throne. The key word in verses 2 and 3 is that word throne. It appears some 42 times in the book of Revelation. 
And many of those times are found right here in, in chapters 4 and 5. For instance, we read about the throne in verses 2 and 3. Take a look at verse 5. And out of the, what's the next word? Throne. Stay with me now. Proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. All right? So there's the throne. Take a look at verse 6. And before the what? Throne. There it is again. There was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the what? Throne. There it is again. And round about the what? Throne. There it is. And so look it down at verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the what? On the throne. That's right. Jump over to chapter 5 and look at verse 11. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And then you jump down to verse 13. And you find in every creature which is in heaven and on, uh, on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessings and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the what? There's the throne, that throne, and him that sat on the throne. The reference to God's heavenly throne speaks of sovereignty. The reference to God's heavenly throne speaks of authority. It speaks of reign. It speaks of absolute power. That's what that throne represents there in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, and really throughout the book of Revelation. And so when we study God's throne or the throne of God, in the book of Revelation, here's what we're reminded. We're reminded that while the events on earth seem chaotic, did you hear me? We're reminded that although the events on earth seem chaotic, and sometimes, often, they seem meaningless, there is one in the universe that is seated on the throne that is in charge and is sovereign and is in control of your life and my life. Amen? And so in the midst of a chaotic and crazy world, thank God there is someone who's still on the throne. Now, I wonder how John felt when he, in, when he, in chapter 4, when he gazes into that heavenly throne, and he tried to describe it. And, and you just imagine his feelings as he gazed at the majesty of that heavenly scene, the beauty of that throne. He saw his eternal creator there on that throne. And all he could do is, is the, had to be able to comprehend it was describe it as like a diamond-like brilliance, a gemstone-like beauty. And that's how he describes it to us. God is seated on the throne. And so there's a center part of worship, okay? The center of worship is the throne. It's the throne. So keep that in mind as we think about worship. <clears throat> now, I want to show you the chorus of worship. The chorus of worship. You know, <clears throat> I like the little chorus that we sang tonight. Uh, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Is that what we sang? I just want to make sure I was on the right course. <laughs> All right. How about God can do anything with anything? That's a good little chorus, isn't it? And we sang that. Did you sing that this morning? And you changed it on me tonight, didn't you? <laughs> and so the chorus. What chorus are we going to sing? That brings us to the chorus of praise we hear around the throne. And so the apostle John, he could hear it as he sees that door is open. He looks into that door, and he sees a throne. And he begins to hear what's happening around the throne. And this is what he heard. Take a look at what he heard there in Revelation chapter 4, and look at verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now the question I have for you is who is that? Who is the one, who are the ones that are clothed in white raiment? And who are the ones who have received crowns? Well, I know who that is. Hey, I've already answered that question, haven't I? Uh, that's you and I. You and I are in white raiment, and you and I have received crowns. Where did we receive crowns? Well, we received them at the judgment seat of Christ. Remember last week we covered the five crowns that you and I received at the judgment seat of Christ. Now watch this now. And verse 9, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the what? The throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders...
fall down before him that sat on the throne. Who are the four and twenty elders? The four and twenty elders, I believe, are the saints of all ages. So that's you and I. We're there. We're a part of that four and twenty elders, all right? <clears throat> so you and I, or these four and twenty elders, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Now, haven't we already established we're going to do that? Last, last week's sermon, remember that? So we cast our crowns before the throne. And look at it now. Here's the chorus. <laughs> What's the chorus? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, <laughs> this is an amazing chorus when you think about it, because it's all pointing to the one who's on the throne, worshiping Jesus <clears throat> forever and ever. Now, look over at Revelation chapter 5, because Revelation chapter 5, it's interesting, because now we look at verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written, and on the back side a seal with seven seals. There's a book, and there's a seal. We can understand that. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Now John's giving us a, a search. He's telling us about a search that took place. And the Bible says they looked above. Uh, they looked, um, verse 3, and no man in heaven. So they looked in heaven. And there was no man worthy in heaven to open the seal uh, on that book. And so that means that Abraham would not have been worthy. And that means Noah would not have been worthy, or Moses would not have been worthy, or David would not have been worthy, or Paul would not have been worthy, or any of the disciples that were there would have been worthy. Hey, you and I are there. We're not worthy to open the seal that's on that book. Then they looked on the earth. That may be where you and I are too. There was nobody there, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And John tells us that as he sees this happening, that what it does is it just breaks his heart because he wants somebody to be able to open that seal that's on that book. And as his heart is broken, according to verse 4, he says, I began to weep. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither to look thereon. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Weep not. John, just stop your crying. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, verse 6 says, In the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, here's the chorus, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seal thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. You keep reading. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. How many angels are there? 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You say, how many is that? That's a lot. That's a lot. Look at what they're saying. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And that chorus just repeats and repeats itself again and again and again and again. 
And you know, you think about the chorus, it's all about the Lord and worshiping the Lord. A preacher of the past, he said this, it was back during World War II, he went to describe worship, and here's what he said. He said, to worship is to quicken the conscience by holiness, by the holiness of God. To feed the mind with the truth of God. This is worship. To purge the imagination by the beauty of God. To open the heart to the love of God and to devote the will to the purpose of God. And I'll, I'll read that to you again because I think that's an important definition of worship. Worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purpose of God. Now that describes the worship in heaven. And that ought to be the goal of every time we worship God down here on earth. That's the chorus. <clears throat> Let me give you the crescendo. You know what a crescendo is, don't you? I learned about the crescendo when I was in elementary school and I was taking music. And my music teacher, Miss Eli, she said this. She said, the crescendo is like the alligator's mouth on music. Starts out small and it goes real big, all right? And so as it starts out small, that means you sing softly. And as it gets bigger, you sing what? You sing louder. That's right. You're good. You guys know what a crescendo is, don't you? Um, how about when we say, Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come. You know, and you get real loud on that part. You know what I'm talking about when we sing this, that Christmas song? Oh, come let us adore him. All right? So that's the crescendo. So what's the crescendo here? I want you to see this because it's interesting. Because what I find as I read this in chapter 4 and 5, there's a progression here. I mean, it's acceleration of praise in this heavenly worship service as it progresses. In this crescendo, it's just a steady increase of volume and force. And so uh, the music here grows louder, it grows stronger, and it reach a, reaches a, a climax uh, and the finish there, and it's just an amazing time. Look back at Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, all right? Watch this. Watch how it just builds. I want to show you this, how it builds here, the worship of and praise to God. <clears throat> In verse 6, it says this, And he are, and hath made us kings and priests unto God. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And do you see that? It says, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right, that's one. Now, let's see if it builds a little bit more. Let's go over to chapter 4, verse 11. We read it already, I believe. Chapter 4, verse 11. <clears throat> Look at verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Oh, we've already added some things here, haven't we? And so it's getting a little bit more force here. To receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now let's go to chapter 5 and verse 13. Chapter 5 and verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say, Blessing and honor and glory. Oh, we're getting more. And power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now jump over to Revelation chapter 7, verse 12. Look at this now. Here's the climax. Here's the finale. Chapter 7, verse 12. And we find saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Do you see it? Do you see how it builds from chapter 1 there to chapter, <clears throat> to chapter 7? And so you find the crescendo of worship in heaven. Now, one last thing I'm going to give you, and I'll be done, and that's the contrast of worship in heaven. As you look at chapters 4 and 5, you'll see some, this pattern of worship. And I believe we ought to understand what worship is really all about, but there's some contrast. And so John looks at heaven through this mysteriously open door that's there. And he saw the grand scale and this gigantic celebration of worshiping God. And, uh, and you know, John's allowed to experience this, but he, was in real he had two realities going on. One, here's what he was on. One hand, he's isolated on the island of Patmos. He's separated from his friends. He's worried about persecution, okay? 
And so he's got problems. So he's in two realities here. And then the very next moment, he's ushered out of that reality through an open door in heaven, and he sees the Lord high, sitting upon the throne. And he sees worship, heavenly worship, taking place. Now, worship took him, watch it now, from loneliness, the loneliness of his discouragement, right into the control room of the universe. That's the power of worship. And as we go through life, you know, we can be discouraged and down and We've got pandemics we're dealing with, and we've got all kinds of problems going on down here on earth. But if we would have just learned to worship God the way that we should worship God, we'll see that open door. And our hearts and minds can be focused on the one who's in control of our life. Boy, I think that can really help us as we go through life and understanding what worship is all about. Let me give you some things, all right? The first thing is this, <clears throat> worship is not about us, it's about Him. Did you hear me? Worship is not about us, it's about Him. As we worship God, we need to remember it's not about us. Song leader gets up, Brother G gets up, and he says, let's turn to 458, and you don't like that song, and you say, man, that was a horrible service. I didn't like the song, I didn't like the special I didn't like that. That's, that's what before Jesus came in. You know, I didn't like those girls singing that song. And, you know, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. It's not about you. It's not about what you like. Okay? It's about Him. Worship is not about you. It's about Him. So we need to understand that as we think about things. And, uh, <laughs> you know, let's take the microphone. Is there a microphone? Yeah, there's a microphone. Have you ever seen somebody when they sing in some churches and they get up and they hold the microphone right up here as they sing and it almost looks like they're at, I'm watching somebody that I used to watch before I got saved in a concert somewhere and they're up here and they're just almost, they've got a good voice, but they're performing. And a lot of the attention is being drawn to themselves. When we sing in church, and we worship the Lord, it's not drawing attention to us. Who should we be drawing attention to? To Him. Why is that? Because worship isn't about you. It's not about me. Worship's about Him. Amen? Amen? And so we need to be careful with that. Let's not draw attention to us. <clears throat> Let's draw attention to Him. Number two, worship is not about here. <laughs> it's about there. Okay? One of the main purposes of worship is to get our minds off of the things and the problems that are going on on earth. You follow me? That's one of the keys of worship. It's not about here. And one of the purposes of worship is to get our minds off the things of the earth and onto the things in heaven. Now, when we do that, when we're able to do that, we're focused more on there than here. And I'll take <clears throat> but in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, um, it says this, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. It says, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish. Boy, I understand what that means, right? Our outward man, this body is perishing, isn't it? They've told me I have arthritis in my knees, probably from all the skateboarding I used to do. And I know some of you are laughing to yourself when you think about that fella up on a skateboard. That's not possible. But yeah, I used to skateboard, all right? File my knees all the time. And um, I damaged my knees. I got arthritis on my knees. And I can feel it when it's outside like today. I can feel it in my knees because my knees ache a little bit more. And it reminds me 
But this outward, this man, this body is perishing. It gets old, gets weaker. It's not the same. And so <clears throat> verse 16 tells us, uh, For which cause we faint not, but though the, our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Hey, you know what worship's about? Not about now, it's about then. Now watch. For our light affliction. Boy, you don't feel like saying that, do you, when you're going through some trials? That it's just a light affliction? Your light affliction? <laughs> uh-uh. It doesn't seem very light. It's heavy. But our light affliction, which is but for a moment, doesn't seem like it's a moment. Seems like it's forever. You ever go through something like that? You're going through some trials, and it seems like it's not going to end? Worketh for us uh, far more exceeding than the eternal weight of glory. Verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, and for the things which are, are seen are uh, for the things which are seen are temporal, temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So what's Paul saying? He basically says the outward man's perishing, the inward man is to be renewed daily. Okay? I've got to renew the inward man daily. Every day I've got to do things to feed the inward man. Even though my outward man is going to perish. Light affliction is today's problem. The eternal glory is tomorrow's promise. The things that are seen are temporary, <clears throat> but the things that are not seen, that's the eternal things. And so worship is that corridor to which we make the exchange of heaven. It's the avenue that leads us from the emptiness of this world to the fullness of the next world. It's the street that leads from decay and discouragement to renewal and glory. And when we fail to worship, we confine ourselves to the despairs of this life. And so this life will get us down. It will discourage us. Let's get our focus on Him. Amen? All right. A.W. Tozer, he said this, and Brother Hatfield, I'll be honest. When I was Brother Josh's age and Brother Garrett's age, <clears throat> and uh, I'm looking around, seeing if there's any other younger ones in here. But uh, when I was their age, I probably wouldn't have understood this completely. But I think you'd understand this, okay? And I hope everybody else here will understand it a little bit more. I think the older you get, the better you understand it. He said, I am of the opinion, Tozer said, that we should not be concerned about working for God now, this is what I mean. I don't know if I'd understand it when I was younger because that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to work, 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 you know, do a work for God. But he said, I'm of the opinion that we should not be concerned about working for God until we have learned the meaning and the delight of worshiping God. So he says, until we can get what worship is all about, and having our focus on Him and worshiping Him, then we probably shouldn't do anything. Boy, that's something, isn't it? Last one is this. Worship is not about one. It's about many. As you study your Bible and you read your Bible, <clears throat> um, you don't find it being about one. You find it being about many. Okay? Um, we're in a time where uh, people are dropping out of church. And as they drop out of church and they don't go to the services anymore, they say, uh, we're going to become individual worshipers. We're going to worship God individually. <laughs> All right? This is my problem with the pandemic, the governor shutting down churches and saying you got to go online. Because as you look at your Bible, when you study your Bible, you'll find that worshiping, can you worship God individually? Yes. But when you find it here in the Bible, do you find individuals? I find, yeah, you'll find him, Kenny. I mean, there are times that John falls and worships, falls down and worships God. But the majority of the time, it is a group of people worshiping God. It's a group. It's many. People say this, well, I don't have to go to church. I can walk along a beach, and I can worship God at the beach. And you know what? You can. You can do that. 
Uh, there's times when the beach, when it's not full of people, you can get down there and listen to the waves and feel the, the breeze blowing in your, in your face. And I was going to say hair, but that's not me. Um, and, uh, and you can get down there and you listen to the seagulls and the water, and it's a beautiful place, and you can begin to worship God down there. Yes, you can. You can worship God at the beach. Some people say, I can worship God in the mountains. Well, that's not here, happening in Delaware. In fact, uh, we showed Josiah. We said, Josiah, we do have mountains in Delaware. And, and, and uh, he said, what do you, you know, he said, Delaware's flat, like Florida's flat. He's from Maine. So I said, here's the mountains. I said, look at our window. And right beside us in the field, there's those nice brown mountains that aren't there very long. They'll pull a tractor up and load them up, and they'll spread it in the field, but then those mountains will disappear, but those mountains are there right now. I said, look at our mountains. Can you smell the mountains? The mountains smell so good right there outside our window in the field. That's the blessing of being in, in the field. And uh, yes, you could hike up in the mountains, and you could worship God up in the mountains, couldn't you? I could do that. I can worship God on the golf course, one person said. I'm sure you could do that too. When I go on the golf course, I get upset and get mad. I, I cannot worship God on the golf course. <clears throat> uh, but when you look at it in the Bible, you'll find it corporate worship. Corporate worship. Revelation chapter 5, you'll find there's corporate worship. In chapter 14, chapter 19, great multitudes of people are worshiping God. It is corporate worship. So you think about it. You think about... You know, I, I can listen to a choir, and a choir can sing, and they can cause me to think about the Lord and begin to worship the Lord. And I like listening to instruments play, and Brother Hatfield gets on that uh, trumpet sometimes, and the pianists, they get over there on that piano, and boy, it just causes me to begin to worship God and thinking about God and lifting my praise to God and all those things. And one day, worshipers, you and I, we will be part of that great multitude, that great choir of all nations. Think about it. We'll be there, part of that choir. You say, I can't carry a tune on earth. It won't matter then. You say, I don't know anything about music. I didn't know what a crescendo was. It won't matter then. <laughs> you might not have any musical talent at all, but it won't matter. And you and I, all who love Christ, will be qualified to sing in that eternal choir all together, our voices will sound all across the universe with a unified statement. We love Jesus. We love Jesus. He is worthy to be praised. So here's the thing. How many of you are headed, headed there? You headed there? I'm heading there. <laughs> As I'm headed there now, you know what? I need to be rehearsing down here now. I'm headed there to heaven. But let's rehearse while we're down here on this earth. Amen? <clears throat> uh, we don't know how long we're going to be here. I mean, it could be trumpet could sound and we'll be up there in heaven right now. Or maybe we might die for some reason. We might die before we leave here tonight if <clears throat> something were to happen. And so we need to be singing for the Lord today. We need to be worshiping the Lord today. Sometimes I see people sitting in the pews, good people, and they don't have a song book out. They're just standing there. I feel so bad for them. You say, I don't like to sing. <laughs> You'll be singing for all eternity up there in heaven, praising Jesus forever and ever and ever. So why don't you get used to it down here? Amen? You say, what are we going to do in heaven? I'll tell you what we do. we'll do. We'll be worshiping Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen? Let's bow our heads for prayer. God, help us. Help us to worship you now. Lord, in the midst, in the midst of the chaos and the confusion and the problems and the trials and the troubles, that we go through every single day, especially this past year, as it just seems like our world has been turned upside down. God, I pray that you'd help us not to focus on what's happening around us, but to lift up our eyes, to look through that open door, 
and they begin to worship our king who's seated on that throne, who has full control of our lives. He has full power of our lives. God, help us to have our hearts and minds focused on our King. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to learn how to worship you properly and to praise and realize that we'll be praising you throughout all eternity. And so God, speak to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand with our head bowed and eyes are closed. The pianist is going to begin to play. Maybe tonight, maybe you're going through some trials and troubles. John was. You know what he did? He ended up worshiping God. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. Maybe you're here tonight and you've got some problems and struggles and difficulties and, and you're getting boggled down with the cares of this world. What you need to do is get your eyes looking up and worshiping God. And say, yes, there's a lot going on right now. It's just chaotic and crazy. I can get it. There's a lot of that happening around the world. But you know what? God is still on the throne. God is still in control and in, in control of our lives. Let's look to Him. Let's bow before Him. Let's worship the Lord. The pianist plays. God spoke to your heart. Why don't you come? Kneel at an altar <clears throat> here and talk to God as God's dealing with you. You just come. Just come and talk to God. Lift your eyes to heaven and talk to Him. God speaking to your heart, you come. If you're here tonight, you're not saved. Why don't you come? You can be saved before it's eternally too late. 